Okay, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to talk today on COVID-19 and the immunosuppressed patient. These are my disclosures. So COVID-19 is, is still prevalent, as we all know. Um, just the, the most recent data as of December this year from, from the WHO reports, more than 770 million cases reported worldwide. And the death toll is really quite um, dramatic. Almost 7 million people to date have died from COVID-19. On the flip side, we've had 13.6 million vaccine doses administered and vaccination still remains the, at the forefront of, of how we manage and prevent the morbidity and mortality associated with this condition. As the pandemic has evolved over time and vaccinations have been introduced, what we're starting to identify is that there are vulnerable groups that still remain at risk of severe disease, particularly those who are immunosuppressed. And it's um, estimated that about 3% of the population in the U.S. meets some sort of definition of immunosuppression, although there can be very loose definitions, i.e. people that are on steroids or people that have chronic conditions versus more stringent definitions of immunosuppression with people with a defined either primary or secondary immunosuppression, probably looking at a prevalence of, of that more defined rate of immunosuppression, just under 1% of the population. But despite being underrepresented in terms of the general population, they're overrepresented in terms of the contribution to morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. Uh, one recently published retrospective cohort from the UK um, demonstrated that although they only accounted for less than 1% of the, the 11 million people that were studied, people that were immunosuppressed accounted for 22% of hospitalizations, 28% of ICU admissions, and 24% of deaths. And the deaths are really in a number of different studies show a much higher relative mortality across a range of immunosuppressed subgroups um, with COVID-19 compared to those without these immunosuppressive illnesses. So when we talk about immunosuppression, broad categories of immunosuppression can be broadly classified into primary and secondary. But even within the, the, the secondary causes of immunosuppression, which are probably the more common ones, not all immunosuppression is the same. Uh, you can broadly classify these into people with malignancies, people who've undergone transplants, and people with acquired secondary immunodeficiency, such as HIV. This graph gives you some idea of the types of immunosuppression that you'll see according to different immunodeficiencies, broadly classified in the cellular, humoral, and innate immunodeficiencies. And not everyone is, who's immunosuppressed suffers from the same level or the same type of immunodeficiency. Probably the one that's most important with respect to COVID-19 is a defect in humoral um, immunity because it's, it's thought that humoral immunity, certainly from the point of view of protection against initial infection and probably progression to severe and critical disease is, is, is probably um, an, an important or, or, or central part of our immune response to COVID-19. And it's also the basis of the protective effect of vaccination. And this is reflected in data. For example, if you look at people with acquired immunodeficiency such as HIV, um, they tend to have quite robust humoral immune responses. They tend to respond very well to vaccinations, and therefore you only really see the at-risk um, profile in people with HIV and those that are either untreated or have advanced immunosuppression despite treatment. But you can see other forms of immunosuppression, in particular hematological malignancies and drug-induced Im immunosuppression will have decreased uh, humoral immune responses, which means per vaccine responses, um, and this is reflected in an overrepresentation of these subgroups within people affected with COVID-19. Vaccination in terms of prevention still remains the, 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 the bedrock of preventive strategies, and that includes people who are immunosuppressed. We know that vaccination is effective in immunosuppressed groups. The difference between immunosuppressed groups and the general population is that the vaccines are not as effective. So, for example, the increases in, in antibody levels post-vaccination can be lower, and the decline in protective antibody responses over time can be faster in people with immunosuppression. But most immunosuppressed people will develop some antibodies post-vaccination. The question is, do they develop enough and how long do they last? There is one probably exception to this group, and it's, it's one that, that I've certainly seen in clinical practice and has been reported in the literature, and that's people who are on treatment with rituximab. And what we tend to find is that people with on rituximab can often have very poor or absent antibody responses. And one Austrian uh, cohort study, for example, showed that 39% of, um, uh, of people 
who on rituximab, only 39% um, developed binding antibodies post-vaccination. And those who developed antibodies post-vaccination were those on rituximab who still had detectable circulating B cells. So there does tend to be this um, this impact of rituximab on B cell function, which will impair antibody responses. With regards to pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis, at the moment, I know that this is being dealt with in, in another presentation, but in the moment, due to circulating variants at the minute, the, the Achilles heel of these treatments is that they are dependent on the circulating variant, and the current circulating variants really don't um, indicate usefulness of, of these agents, and therefore they're not currently recommended. But that may change in the future if we see a, a change in the circulating variant of COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. The one particular aspect of, of immunosuppressed infection with SARS-CoV-2 is, is persistence. And really, we have to, in a way, throw the, the textbook away when it comes to periods of isolation and periods of infectivity when you're dealing with people who are immunosuppressed who contract, uh, who contract SARS-CoV-2. There's a now a wealth of data that's described persistence of infection. And this isn't just persistence of PCR-positive SARS-CoV-2, but it's actually persistent recovery of viable virus and therefore potential for ongoing and ongoing transmission from these cases. But when you look across the literature, most of the case reports and case series that are that are described describe people who have oncohematological disease or are on anti-CD20 therapy, such as rituximab. And it's often seen in the absence of a detectable antibody response. And the downside to this is that it's these sorts of individuals with persistent replicating infection that can drive evolution of the virus. And this has been demonstrated in, in some studies with development of mutations within an individual with persistent infection. And this obviously has both public health and infection prevention control implications within the hospital setting to avoid onward transmission. And there really is no clear treatment approach to persistence that's been so far identified. <clears throat> this is one small uh, study, but it's probably one of the better studies put together. It's in a pediatric population of, of 91 subjects. Um, median age was 15 years. And, and you can see just on the graph here just how long it takes for these individuals to become PCR negative. So the median time to two negative PCRs in this particular group is 42 days. Now, when they looked at the differences between those that had um, oncological versus hematological malignancies, they didn't see any significant differences. Uh, but this is probably one of the largest case series, series to date and highlights the problem that you have with persistence to SARS-CoV-2 in this vulnerable population. So how do you go about managing persistence? Well, there's no clear consensus approach. Um, even management of SARS-CoV-2 in general in immunosuppressed populations is really a lack of clinical trial data. When you look at um, most clinical trials of antivirals or immunomodulatory agents, actively exclude people with, who are immunosuppressed, which seems um, a bit counterintuitive when we're looking at a disease at the moment in which this particular subgroup are probably the, the most vulnerable and potentially um, would, would gain the most benefit from, from these treatments, that the trials that are designed to, to market or, or license these treatments don't include those that are most in need. Uh, when you look what's happened within the literature for persistent infection, convalescent plasma has been used occasionally more than once. Uh, uh, neutralizing monoclonal antibodies have been described. Antivirals by themselves or alongside monoclonal antibodies have been have also been trialed. And there's also certainly an indication that the time of anti-CD20 therapy, if that's possible, um, can facilitate clearance of virus. Um, in, in terms of treatment options, well, you have antivirals, you've got the immunomodulatory agents, and you've got the neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. And, and I'm not going into this in too much detail, but uh, for example, we know that antivirals can be effective against multiple variants. They come in oral or IV preparations, but again, some of them have been linked with resistance. The immunomodulatory agents, the trick we use in those is understanding how they're going to interact with the underlying immunosuppression or interact with, with the other medications that are being used to treat the immunosuppression in the individual at risk. And neutralizing um, monoclonal antibodies, again, they're, they're really variant dependent, but there is some very nice data that can, that, that's shown that if you identify people that have no humoral antibody response that have uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, that you can actually decrease mortality quite significantly. One study showed a 63% decrease in mortality in a small study of, of patients with B-cell malignancy, but the large RCTs, 
of convalescent plasma really haven't shown at convincing efficacy. So the jury's still out in terms of how we, how we use these treatments in people with immunosuppression. And I guess it is a bit of a mix and match approach. This is a recent publication of a, a case series that shows you the different types of approaches that have been used in people with varying forms of immunosuppression. For example, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you can see people with advanced HIV. And um, you can see the difficulty here. You, know, you have some individuals who get multiple courses of antivirals, some prolonged courses of antivirals, some people who have prolonged courses of antivirals followed by combinations of antivirals and monoclonal antibodies. So it really is no, there's no one direct way of doing this. And, and it really is an intuitive approach, probably a stepwise intuitive approach to try and find the, the, the right combination that will result in viral clearance. So this leads us to this, this concept of, uh, can we tease out those people with immunosuppression who are most at risk? For example, those who don't have good antibody responses um, and how much antibody response do you need? Because it's ideally, if you can identify those with no antibody response, they're probably the people that are most at risk of both persistence of infection as well as disease progression. And they would really benefit from, from early treatment. <clears throat> well, we know that not everybody responds to vaccination or prior infection. We know that immunosuppressed individuals derive less benefit from vaccination and have higher morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. So the key is how do we identify that subgroup that haven't benefited from vaccination and remain at risk? At the minute, most of our treatment guidelines are based around clinical risk. And really what we need to do is to drive the field forward in terms of identifying that the level of immunity um, below which it, you can identify people that are most in need of early treatment. And this will help us to avoid missed opportunities for early treatment and hopefully be able to impact on hospitalizations, ICU admissions and deaths within this significant vulnerable group. And this is work that we've been doing to try and, and identify these thresholds of immunity, a publication that was recently published just in, in November in Nature Communications. And what we did was we looked within a, a, a cohort study that's based in Ireland. It's a multi-centric cohort called the All-Ireland Infectious Diseases Cohort. And what we have is over 4,000 people who provide consent for routine use of the clinical data for research together with a biobanking of a number of different samples. And this gives us the ability to look at, at correlations between circulating antibody levels as well as underlying viral neutralizing capacity across uh, not only a number of different types of cohorts, but also across time. And, and what we did within the AIID was to derive three cohorts. We looked at an unvaccinated cohort who'd had SARS-CoV-2 infection. So this was from the early stages of, of, of the pandemic. We looked at a post-two-dose vaccination cohort. And then we looked at a more recent cohort, which would have been predominantly infected with the Omicron variant um, that had also been vaccinated. So this is a hybrid immunity cohort. You can see that the demographics within the cohorts pretty much match what you would expect. And most of these people, if you look down at the RBD levels, had good RBD responses, apart from maybe that unvaccinated convalescent cohort, where the RBD responses were a bit lower than the, the vaccinated cohorts. And a variety of different types of, of virus that, that people have been infected with. But what we were able to do was to look at viral neutralization against wild type virus, the beta virus, and the Omicron virus. So we're able to look at the impact over, over time and variance. Now what we were able to show in this study was a very close correlation um, between viral neutralization, this is identified as the NT50. So how much virus, you need, how, how uh, much you need to dilute plasma to, to, before you lose the, the, the underlying viral neutralization, together with the, the um, antibody levels. In this case, this is the receptor binding domain binding antibody. And you see the very, very close correlation. The higher your antibody level, the higher your underlying viral neutralization. And what we did was we used a statistical approach called the UDEN index to identify which antibody level was closely correlated to an NT50 of one in a thousand. Now, NT50 of one in a hundred is used for licensing of uh, vaccines. What we wanted to do was to go one log above that to ensure that our NT50 against wild type would retain some efficacy against variants. It's normally what you do is you lose about one log of your NT50 with, with, with most of the variants. And what we identified was a, a, an RBD teeter of four, five, six, 
very um, very uh, sensitive mean specifically predicted an underlying viral neutralization of greater than one in a thousand against wild type. And this was the, the, the threshold that we brought forward in the validation study. So when we looked at, at this within cohort two, which was the two vaccine dose, the first thing you see here is that there's much fewer people within this cohort that have low antibody levels because they've all been vaccinated. Nevertheless, when you use the four, five, six cutoff, the positive and negative predictive values stay above the 80%. And the overall accuracy of, of this threshold to predict that a meaningful underlying neutralizing capacity remains at 80%. Similarly, when you look at a, a hybrid immunity cohort, again, because you've got hybrid immunity and vaccination, very few individuals have um, an RBD of less than 500, but those that have the RBD less than 500 have lower underlying capacity, those above the 500 still retain excellent um, excellent viral neutralization against both wild type and against Omicron. So we believe that they, these sorts of data do offer a, 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 a meaningful threshold at which to identify those people that are most at risk and whether this can be introduced in the clinical practice will be the, the focus of, of future studies. And just finally to finish up, um, the I think the clinical trial environment is, is is following the changes in the pandemic. As I said previously, a lot of the clinical trials, they haven't included immunosuppressed people, but that is changing. And one example of that is, is the STRIVE consortium. This is a large consortium from the INSIGHT network. It's certainly got, currently got 27 countries with more than 180 sites, and it's examining two trials, STRIVE 1 and STRIVE 2. And STRIVE 2 is really the the, the trial that I think will be most relevant to the, the cohort that are immunosuppressed. And this is looking at early administration of the second immune modulator in addition to steroids compared to standard of care. Platform-based trial, the first, um, the, 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 the first study that they will be um, that, that they will be looking at is coming online now, but it's a one-to-one -one randomization against the active agent versus a placebo in, in those who are hospitalized on low flow oxygen and who've had either baseline dexamethasone or baricitinib. So this will be a, an important study to look forward to. The, the first intervention is Abatacept and we'll, we'll see how that progresses over 2024. Primary outcome is, is days to recovery, so it's a clinical outcome-based study. And most importantly, they are not excluding immunosuppressed individuals. Um, you can see here that they do want to exclude those people who are immunosuppressed who have had recent either active infection or change in their immunomodulatory, um, immunomodulatory drugs because that could impact on the scientific integrity of the study. But I think that the exclusion criteria is still broad enough for us to get some useful information in this vulnerable subgroup. So just to summarize, uh, immunosuppressed people continue to be at risk of worst health outcomes from COVID-19. People with immunosuppression are underrepresented in therapeutic clinical trials, but hopefully that, that will change over time. Um, data do point to this clinically relevant threshold of immunity. So an RBD of around 500 and below that, what you're looking at is, is the, the underlying neutralization against the, the virus is suboptimal, which fits with the persistence data, fits with what we're seeing around more recent clinical progression data as well. Um, and our future needs are really the, these trials such as TRIBE2, which are gonna test uh, interventions in those most at need, and also to develop the relative benefit of immune therapies versus direct antivirals versus combination approaches. So I think we're going to need multiple arms on these trials to really get the right answer. And we need some way of converting threshold immunity data into some way to rapidly identify people that are non-immune so that when they are contracting SARS-CoV-2, we can very rapidly initiate treatment in those most at risk. Uh, with that, I'd like to just acknowledge the, the members of the, the CEPHIC group in UCD and thank you for your attention.